GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. Don't get caught in the hype cycle. I'm Jay Bird, and I believe that on-chain revenue sharing models are going to change the world. That's why I'm carving a path for doers to confidently build and invest in Web3. Today's episode is all about base paint. Now, you might have heard of Base Paint during on chain summer. It was one of the on chain apps built on Base that really took off. And for good reason, Zach, one of the co founders, is here today to tell us all about it. Let me set this up for you. There are very few consumer apps that are fun to use and not about speculation right now. So, Base Paint was conceived as an art project that could easily be built on top of of on-chain and could not be done off-chain. This is only possible on-chain. And in this app, artists collaborate and share in the profits generated from their collaboration, from their collective work. So every day since their launch in August, artists come together on base paint and then they paint a shared canvas for 24 hours. This is pixel art. And then once that 24 hours passes, the artwork is minted as an open edition NFT and then the profits are distributed amongst the contributors based on the number of pixels that they contribute. Now, as a result of this, over 2,500 artists have contributed to over 70 pieces and generated over 190 ETH in profit to artists. So we're talking about major impact here. And Zach, who joined us today, has a very interesting perspective on the importance right now that we build on-chain apps that are not speculative in nature. Because Zach comes from, he started his crypto journey at Consensus in 2018. He's worked with Bitcoin Core. He's worked with Filecoin, Arweave. He's worked with Gitcoin. So he's worked with a lot of projects in the space. And his background as a product designer really showed him that we need more fun things to do on chain that are not necessarily about speculation. Now, I guess there is a little bit of speculation in base paint because if you collect these pieces, you might hope that they go up in value, but that's not the point here. The point here is that he has built an app that really achieves two things. One, it allows for collaboration on chain, which is something that we're starting to hear. We hear the words co-creation, we hear curator rewards, we hear all these words that are new that have not existed really before on chain. It's same as at the start of the internet. There was a lot of new terms. Well, these are the new terms that are really excited about here at Web3 Academy. And then the other thing is it allows this revenue share model. And we have not been able to do revenue share in this way before. It is not possible in the Web2 world. And so that is really, really exciting for everybody that is building in this space, for everybody who's participating in this space because these things are going to lead to entire new business models, to entire new way that we can interact online and IRL as a result of building on blockchain. So without further ado, I'm super excited for you to listen to this conversation with Zach all about base paint and the future of on-chain collaboration and rev share models. Before we jump in, we'll just take a minute to hear from our sponsor. Modern newsletters are built on Paragraph. That's right. Paragraph is a brand new newsletter platform that combines the best parts of Web2 and Web3 to supercharge newsletters for both writers and readers. Build a community, not just an audience. Paragraph uses blockchain tech to allow readers to collect and own the words that matter to them. This takes reading a newsletter to the next level. With Paragraph, readers can mint, collect, and show off quotes from their favorite newsletters. This opens new possibilities like creators sharing revenue with fans. I also love their new feature, Paragraph AI. This integrates GPT-4 natively in Paragraph to create, edit, and improve your writing effortlessly with one click. And guess what? We at Web3 Academy are on board and have already moved our content over to Paragraph. We believe this is the future of newsletters because of the profound engagement it creates between creators and fans. So whether you're a creator, writer, 
or an avid reader, it's time to check out Paragraph and capitalize on the opportunity of being early. GM, GM, Zach, welcome to Web3 Academy. GM, super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really excited to have you. You just passed 100 days of base paint. paint. I think you're at 106 or 107. I can't remember exact. So congrats, first of all. It's been incredible to watch you. You know, it's only been 100 days. The accomplishments you've had so far, I know about 600 artists are participating in each daily piece of art. And then these pieces are being auctioned off in an open edition mint and anywhere between 200 up to, I think, maybe 3,500 is the highest piece that has had minters on it. Hundreds of ETH be in total volume. Did you expect Base Paint to be this successful when you launched it? No, not at all. <laughs> no, I was jamming with uh, Winter, a friend of mine. And I think on the ramp up, you know, we were, we had kind of set ourselves a damn deadline to do this in two weeks because that's all either of us had time for. And I told him it had been like, it's just, it's been a, dis it's been a difficult winter, right? And so I told him if a hundred people use this, I'll be happy. Like, <laughs> because it's just been like, it's been such a grind to get people to try something new and, and do new things on chain. And so, yeah, like I, I think both of us were kind of expecting this is a really cool idea. It was kind of like a artistic expression of what we wanted on chain consumer applications to be. And we wanted to kind of like do it along with the base launch because we were thinking like that'd be a really good way to like at least get people on that first day. And it was something where we were like, you know, this will be really fun. People will play with it for a week and then it'll fizzle out and we can say like we launched this really fun you know, our place on chain thing. So it was really, that was the expect the expectations of it. Cannot believe we're on day 100. <laughs> and so 100 days in, I'm sure the, the amount of effort you're putting into this has changed that beyond oh, yeah. your expectation. How has your, your work changed? How have your expectations changed? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, the work has changed simply because like, I think with the inception of every project, there's like a lot of work into the initial bootstrapping, right? Mm -hmm. And so like on the week leading up to it, we were cold DMing artists that we knew or would probably didn't even know. Like I know Winter was working his connections to like get an intro to artists that he really admired. I had worked with some artists previously at the startup I'm at. And we were just kind of like DMing people going like, we got this big launch, but we don't know how it's going to go. Can I like put this thing in your hand and I'll hand on board you into this to just like try it out. So there's a ton of focus on like this first like five to 10 users. Mm -hmm. Now that we've kind of like transitioned and the art is kind of like almost runs itself. We have these amazing artists who, you know, if you're there on the start of the day, that's one of the most interesting times to join because the theme drops. Suddenly you're like, oh, this is the new theme. And artists start like sketching out what a cohesive thing could be or like the well for today for instance they're drawing they drew a path out and like a rose garden sort of thing and then other artists start innovating like drawing on top of it which has just been really fascinating to kind of go from like zero to one people not really sure what this is like starting to experiment to like this emergence of like a higher higher order i guess is kind of like the best way to explain it where it's like it's not just individual stamps around like a specific theme it's a cohesive piece of artwork done by these different artists so our role has shifted a little bit more on the strategic side so like chatting with folks who want to run theme days like partnerships sort of thing we are kind of reimagining the brush system so that folks still have access i think one of the design principles is like low cost keep it as accessible as possible so we want to make it to where people can come in, they can paint, but in a system that sort of discourages spammers and people pix pixel harvesting, not necessarily there for the art, but there for like wherever money they can, they can scrape away on the mints. And so it's turned more into like a strategic, like what's kind of like, yeah, strategic sort of understanding where the community is kind of headed and then trying to innovate on that path. I think mm -hmm. it's interesting. Which is a good problem to have. Yeah. I mean, users, man, like <laughs> yeah. hey. build, build a lot of crypto projects. It's nice to have users every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I just want to go through some high level numbers and then I want to explain base paint to everybody to make sure they understand it. But I grabbed some of these numbers before we hit record here. So, to so far, 190 ETH in profit has been distributed to about 2,500 artists. Mm -hmm. You've had 15,000 unique collectors that have collected about 70,000 
pieces of art. And you've, this number I love, you've onboarded 5,000 new wallets onto base, which is really amazing to see, or over 5,000, I believe. So not only are these people already in the ecosystem, you're bringing new people into Web3, which we've talked a lot about how consumer apps are going to do that on our show and how we're so, we're just so early right now that we don't have enough people on chain, but there is going to be that moment when adoption really comes not from speculation and investment and people buying crypto for speculation. It'll come from people just downloading an app and wanting to play and wanting to participate because it's fun, because it's easy, because it's simple. And then there's some other benefits like revenue share or co-creation. And these are the things that Basepaint has. So with that sort of background, for somebody who hasn't heard of Basepaint before, can you explain how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So I think like the the closest analogy that most people will probably be familiar with is Reddit's R place. That was actually kind of the starting point for me. I think Winter had been playing around with this idea before even earlier, but before we launched, I walked by my wife on the couch doing our place. And I'd seen it before and I had it explained before, but just watching her behavior, there's like an aha moment, kind of an unlock. And it's a shared canvas where different people on different subreddits coordinate to draw different things using pixel art. So base paint is inspired by our place. It's essentially a shared canvas. So when you log in, you can see everyone else painting. You see their cursors painting pixel art. It is a open canvas. So for 24 hours, people can paint what they want. There's a theme and a limited color palette. So folks can can draw around those themes. And then after 24 hours, the canvas is frozen, it's locked, and then it's moved into an open edition. And then that open edition is it's open for 24 hours. You could mint as many people as, as they want, can mint as many editions, copies as they want. And then at the end of the 24 hours, it's over. Once that 24 hours is completed, the profits of the open edition mint are then distributed to every artist that participated the day before. It is distributed proportionally based off of the number of pixels that you've put down. And it's also a total number of pixels. So uh, you draw something on hour one and on hour 23, it gets covered up. That's fine. You still get credit for it. It's still part of the art. It's still part of the story, kind of the emerging artwork over those 24 hours. So yeah, that's kind of a super top level how base paint work. Okay. So I want to double click on a few of those things just to make sure people understand the really the mechanisms of all this if you haven't engaged in base paint before. And I hope after this episode that everybody will go either become an artist or become a collector on base paint because it is a lot of fun. So first, let's just talk about how does an artist get access to participate in this 24 hour open canvas? That's a great question. So we have a, we basically, we have a, we love NFTs. So we built a lot of base paid utilizing NFTs. There's two different NFTs. There's two different NFT or smart contracts for base paid. One controls the canvas and the profits and distribution, everything. The other smart contract controls what we call base paid brushes. Brushes are essentially what an artist comes in and they mint. A brush costs the same as a canvas. There's no, I think it's 0.0026, which ETH, which is was four bucks at the time. It's probably five bucks now. If we continue to go up, we'll have to reduce prices because we want kind of to keep this accessible. But an artist comes in, they mint a brush. The brush is not an open edition. Originally, we had one brush mint every 15 minutes. That became too much because mm -hmm. otters found it and started gaming the system. So we had to slow down the, the brush mint. Honestly, brushes are kind of like the thing that we're most interested in completely redesigning because there's still some still some mechanism we haven't quite figured out yet. Mm -hmm. And we have some really cool ideas that we're working on, but we haven't quite got it. And so an artist comes in, they mint their brush if they're able to, and then that's their brush. Every brush has a pixel count. So a, a starter brush has a hundred pixels that you can lay down. And then that is essentially how uh, the number of pixels that you can put down on the canvas is enforced. It's on chain. Your your brush. One of the attributes of it is pixels. Whenever you mint or whenever you commit your art to the canvas, it checks the number of pixels that you're laying down against the number of pixels in your brush. And once that finishes, the brush the canvas rolls over, and then your 100 pixels is basically replenished daily. So every new canvas you have uh, a new 100 pixels or however many paint pixels you have 
in the brush to paint on the canvas? So we basically have two main stakeholders in your community or in your ecosystem you're building. We have artists or contributors or creators, and then we have collectors. You mentioned that you had a bot issue, which no surprise, very unfortunate, but yeah. that's all part of on-chain activities when you have the possibility to make money. I know that you have taken steps such as requiring an ENS or a Coinbase wallet profile. Can you talk about what you've done to eliminate bots? Whew. I mean, we haven't eliminated them, unfortunately. We've just made it harder to bot. First step was an ENS name, just requiring an ENS name, especially in the early days when mints were pretty low. Basically, it's all about like kind of like cost to bot, right? Like profit, profit motive around that. And so we were thinking like, okay, like five dollars to register or any of this may not kind of outweighs some of the profit motive for for some of these guys that can't spin up too many of them. It becomes more and more expensive to DDoS our brush mint system. The next step was age of wallet. So we instituted like a wallet has to be, I think like we first we started with 15 days and we noticed people were spinning up a whole bunch of wallets to let them age into 15 days. And we kind of continue to increase it. I think it's now at like a hundred days. And then finally, yeah, we've moved on. We're, we're currently testing out something called, it was a Coinbase attest, attestation, I believe. Oh, you are? Very yeah, interesting. We just yeah. talked about that on the show last oh, week. Cool. Very neat. Yeah. So we're trying it out. We, uh, we've just deployed, I think Winter just deployed it two or three days ago. And I'm kind of basically watching the brush contract now and watching the mints go because we paused them for a little bit just because we were like, this is kind of a losing, this is sort of like a losing game. So we restarted the brush mints with Coinbase attestation. And uh, I basically have the smart contracts up and I'm like clicking on each brush and looking at what they're painting to see if that has helped with the bot problem uh, at all. We're still still figuring it out. Can you explain, just since you brought up Coinbase attestation, we talked a little bit about it on our weekly news show, the roll-up last week, because we're so excited about on-chain identity and verified identity is such an, not just for the on-chain world, to be honest, it's a problem for the entire, it will solve a lot of issues we have like globally. You know, you could do a whole podcast on that. Can you explain how you're using Coinbase attestations like, and what it allows you to do? I'm unfortunately I can't. That was something winter shipped over the weekend. I uh, did not. I was not privy to. So unfortunately not. No worries. No worries. All good. Okay. So you have the painters who are the artists who come in. They mint a brush. And is there? Am I correct that there's two levels of brushes? There's four. Oh wait. Four. Okay. Three, four. Yeah. There's four. There's four levels. So when we started, there was only two, because again, we weren't sure if people are going to show up. So we started with two. We started with the gold brush that had 5,000 pixels. We started with 100 pixels, mostly because we were like, well, if it's just Winter and I filling up the entire canvas, then that's what we'll do. You know, like it'll be a fun day project thing where we can we can do that. Basically what happened was after two or three weeks, more people came in, more people were making really cool things with just 100 pixels. We have like kind of a running thread. I need to kind of continue to post to that. We have a running thread on Twitter of just like amazing 100 pixel brushes. Because one of the first things that we hear whenever artists come in is like 100 pixels is too few. People have shown incredible ingenuity with just 100 pixels. Like Dune is one of my favorite canvases. And the centerpiece of the entire canvas was someone that someone made really early on. It was 100 pixels. They just made, they painted a, a single Fremen kind of like in like the golden ratio, like right at the point where you would want it in like a proper painting. And people just kind of like connected to it. They, they hooked onto it and then they created this incredible piece surrounding this single 100 pixel painting that this person made. Hmm. So we realized that we needed to start graduating people in, but pixel inflation was going to become a thing. 5,000 pixels in the context of our canvas, which is only, I believe, it's like 144 pixels by 144 or 188. I can't remember. It's Game Boy. It's actually a uh, Game Boy. That could be really overwhelming. So then we introduced three or two two other levels, which is a bronze brush and a silver brush at 5,000 pixels and 1,000 pixels. Yeah. Uh, and, and as people add to it, we upgrade their brush. And That's what I was going to ask. They just get upgraded on chain or is that a manual process right now that you are upgrading them as a result of their contribution? I guess to both. It is a manual process that happens on chain. Okay. We're, again, part of the brush refactor, we're trying to kind of reconsider how we make this like more of a predictable thing. We started experimenting with voting, uh, community like community curation. 
any of the themes. And I think that's something we're interested in exploring on the brush side as well. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So that actually, you bring up the themes leads me into my next question. So I come onto the platform, I mint a brush, cost me about four or five dollars US, whatever the equivalent of ETH is. And then I have this brush. And so now I can contribute to the daily theme. Tell us about the daily theme. How is it picked? And tell us a little bit about the parameters, because I think if you haven't participated in this before, you might think this sounds like total chaos. Like how could a nice piece of art? Now I can tell you these are beautiful pieces of art. I've looked through all 100 plus of them and they're amazing. But give us an idea of how that happens. Yeah. So uh, starting out, uh, the themes were just selected by Winter and I. And then we started running out of ideas. And so we figured the community would probably have really good ideas in terms of like what they wanted to paint. And so the first stab at community curation for themes and essentially like just to, for your audience, a theme is just a thing that it's basically meant to kind of inform the art that is being drawn on the canvas. It could be a theme like Dune, like the book Dune. It could be X copy, which was like one of our highest minted ones. Pokemon or something is like, I would say broad as like lo-fi or Tokyo, but it's a thing that is meant to kind of like constrain the number of things that you're drawing on the canvas. For the first 30 days, we kind of just came up with a whole bunch of themes and tried to match them with like really compelling palettes that we'd sourced from Lopsec, from colors, from a couple of different places, and then like kind of innovated, found like some palettes that we really liked as well. And then basically what happened was, yeah, I mean, like by day 30, we started running out of ideas and I've always been a big fan of nouns and this idea of like community led creation and curation. And, and so we actually worked with prop house for our first round of themes, which I still think turned out incredible and essentially had everyone submit theme ideas. And, and then the canvases that you meant, because like, that's the collector, that's the people that have signaled that they like the art and want to own the art. And so we basically say that the collector, the person that owns the art is then able to signal their interest in what they would like to see drawn. And so over Prop House, we did the first week. Uh, it was awesome. It went really well. Uh, but we realized we weren't saving ourselves a ton of work when we were transferring the themes from Prop House back into the app. Mm -hmm. And something that I've really liked about Base Paint has been we've tried to keep as much of the crypto experience in app as possible. So like we don't have a Discord. We have a chat next to the canvas. We don't necessarily have like a snapshot forum or anything like that. We have theme voting within the application itself. And so we basically reversed it. We said, okay, well, instead of coming up with a cool theme and finding a good palette, what if we gave people a really good palette and then asked them what should, what theme matches that palette? And we rolled it out maybe three weeks ago. And so now every day there's a new palette. People will come to, they look at the palette, they submit their suggestions for the first 12 hours. All the votes are hidden. So that you just kind of like, you can either submit your own palette or you can vote on, on something you like. And then in the last 12 hours, the votes are revealed. So you can kind of see which ones are edging those out. And then folks can then like kind of continue to vote. Whichever one is, has the highest number of canvases signal that this is the theme that they like. That theme is the, is the new base paint. It's the theme for that day. And you need to have collected at least one piece in order to vote. Yeah. Yeah. But we do it quadratic style. So one canvas is one vote. I think four canvases is two votes and right. so on and so forth. Okay. So it is weighted voting, but it's like quadratic funding, like Gitcoin yes. does that type yeah, of thing, which is too mathematical for me. But yeah. basically the idea is it's not one token, one vote. It's, it's a not, little we, bit more balanced than that. Yeah. No, we just, so far we haven't seen whales come in and just dominate. And yeah. so that's kind of what we wanted. Like we didn't want one person who had a thousand canvases to just say, now draw me this. Now draw me this, right? Like we wanted to still make it community and where the smaller holders had a much stronger stay, say, than just like with a pure holder system. Right. There's three things that you can do mainly in the app. You mm -hmm. can paint if you're a creator and you get a brush, as we talked about. You can vote if you want to, if you're a collector and you want to vote on what the next day's theme is. And you can mint or collect if you are a collector or you want to support the project. Let's talk about the minting and the collecting phase because we haven't really touched on that yet. So you mentioned, is it immediately after the piece of art is finished that it opens for o open edition? Take us through that process. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, on the front page, you see people painting, right? Um, on the top right corner, you see a countdown. 
says like 12 hours remaining, five hours remaining, 30 minutes remaining. And once that hits zero, we call it the canvas flip. So the canvas is cleared, the new palette appears, you see the new theme. And then on the mid page of the new ca the canvas from the previous 24 hours, like the artwork that we just worked on is populated inside of the mint page. And then you're able to mint it and it currently displays kind of like the highest number of contributors. And we have ideas on how to make that a lot more engaging. We want to celebrate new contributors as well, and that sort of thing. So there's ideas on how to make it better, but yeah, it's essentially as soon as that canvas flips, you're able to bid. Okay. And I just, to share some of the results here, I was looking at your most popular mints. So day 44 was Lens Garden. Lens, Lens is a partner of ours and we're big fans of everything awesome. they're doing. So love, love seeing that. And it's a beautiful piece that use it, has lots of brand imagery and things from the Lens ecosystem. And that minted almost 3,500 times. And that was 645 artists that shared 8.1 ETH. So that would have been a decent payday for a yes. lot of those artists. Day 22 with X copy was number two. That minted 2,300 times. 500 artists earned 5.5 ETH. Day 25 was Pokemon, red versus blue, minted 2,000 times, 540 artists earned 4.8 ETH. So you've got, you know, at the higher end, now on the lower end, a more, a low day would be, I think, about 200 collectors, but it's always about 600 artists, it seems. Yeah. 200 collectors, maybe, and it would mint total volume, maybe 0. 0.5 ETH or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, that's about, I mean, and so to me, like that's kind of the, that's the interesting challenge of base pay right now is the building things that utilize the canvases in a way to like, I don't know, continue to continue to reward correct collectors because collectors are rewarding the artists. And so you want to like continue to incorporate canvases as ways to kind of inform the project to kind of complete the loop. Cause that is like, that's the stakeholder loop, you know, the artists and the, and then the collectors and you want to kind of inform I want to make that a virtuous cycle where one feeds into the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people who don't know Base Paint, it's very easy to say, oh, that's a niche artist app, mm -hmm. right? That's an app for artists. Oh, I'm not an artist. I don't belong here. But I think that a lot of people are missing the bigger picture here. And I'd love to talk about that. And maybe that gets into the conversation in the future of Base Paint. I'm not sure where this goes. But to me, there's two key things at play here that were not possible before on-chain. And that's what we love to talk about here at Web3 Academy is what can only be done on-chain. Mm -hmm. And those two things are this co-creation or collaboration, which does not necessarily have to apply to art. Co-creation and collaboration is something that a lot of people are talking about using on-chain, but I don't necessarily... There isn't enough examples of it yet that there hasn't been a model figured out. And then the other is this revenue sharing idea mm -hmm. that you should get compensation for your contribution. And in your case, it's great that there's these, your revenue share is based upon the number of pixels you contribute. Mm -hmm. So it's very quantifiable, which might not be so easy in other use cases. Uh, I'm curious, you know, what have you learned from this project? What has it inspired in you and how are you thinking about maybe the future of base paint or maybe other concepts or models on chain? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. So I'm probably going to need to think about that for a little bit. To me, like co-creation, like to your point, because I know, you know, you said, I, I think it's a valid hesitancy. I'm not an artist. So how can I, how can I contribute? We have people who aren't, I would say, traditional artists come in and contribute. The act of collaboration actually allows you to still contribute meaningfully, even if you aren't Michelangelo, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of like one of the beautiful aspects of base paint. One of my favorite things of the last like two to three years, that's not even web three related, like the duets on TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. It was like almost like an exquisite corpse of like one person would post one video, one person would post a secondary video. And occasionally you got these like really wonderful chains of people adding to the joke, even as like it kind of continued to progress. And so by the end of it, you watch the original video probably 20 times, but it was still entertaining every time because each new innovation kind of surprised and delighted you as a, as a viewer. 
And so I, I see collaboration everywhere, not just in Web3. One of the things that excited me about Base Paint is that Base Web3 enables kind of like a new form of collaboration, but like also like incentivized collaboration, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't, you do have vandals occasionally, but most people drawing art are incentivized to make the best art possible because that theoretically leads to a higher mint. It's a really direct incentive alignment, input, output. Good art equals good art around a good theme equals higher mint day, right? Like, and you even kind of cited it in the gallery that the most popular mints were the ones with kind of like the broadest appeal. So even collectors are kind of like incentivized to think like, oh, well, people like this, or I've, you know, I've seen like people really interested in that. They're not just like collectors, they're almost like curators when they start buying into the base paint system. So it's just been really fun. In terms of like what I'm really interested to experiment with, I'm really interested to experiment further in storytelling, right? Like that TikTok idea, that is like storytelling in that like it's sort of like an exquisite corpse where people keep adding to the story or like the message. Each new video is like a new revealed detail in the same story being retold over and over again. But I am really interested in, you know, either on base paint or elsewhere, kind of this idea of people kind of like coming together and then co-creating lore within the project itself. And then the outcome of that being something where everyone is related is not just like rewarded financially, but then also like has a say in kind of like the future of, I guess, like the next steps in within the next chapter within it, I think is just kind of like an interesting way to think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that there's, it's really hard to wrap your, your mind around this stuff right now. You know, like you say, we've all heard this uh, storytelling in NFTs. If you're in, in NFTs, you can't not hear storytelling. It's yeah, like yeah. part of everybody's roadmap and, you know, create our lore and whatnot. And this idea of co-creation is very possible when you have a token or a way to, what I love that you guys have done is you've created a way to simply enable anybody to participate by, you know, it's a very low cost to mint a brush, but then you also have levels where as you contribute more, then you can level up to a higher level where you have, I guess, a wider range of contribution that you can make your, you know, in, in the case of base paint, you have mm -hmm. more you can do on the canvas. In the case of maybe a storytelling, you could produce more in the story. But I think it's hard for people to grasp, but okay, but how do I come up with a story with a whole bunch of people at the same time? Here's a good example. Oh my God, Kirby, OMG Kirby. I don't know if you heard of them. They were really big, maybe like they were big in the bull run. They got a lot of attention because they created a DAO that together created music. And the way they did it was that you could join the DAO by collecting their NFT. It was an NFT collection. And then they, I don't know if it was quadratic voting or what the voting mechanism was, but in some way, once you had an NFT, you could vote on the music. And what they quickly realized was what worked the best was actually if they came together in Discord and did like jam sessions, and then that led to the best output. Now, in the case of the art, you have the chat along the side of the art, right? But there's not necessarily, I feel like the thing about a canvas is it's quite, I don't want to one dimensional in a way, right? There's only so much you can do with it, right? Whereas with a story or with with a no song, yeah. with who knows, you can go a lot of different directions. But this idea of, okay, we can build our community, we can know who the active members are because we can have an on-chain token, and then we can give them simple ways to contribute and to get involved and everybody can feel part of the output, whatever that might be. That type of co-creation, I think we're, go we're going to see a lot more of that. I mean, even Nike Swoosh has talked a lot about how their platform is all about co-creation. They've done a little bit of it with, I think they had a contest where artists could draw their future shoes and you could enter into it. And I don't think it was necessarily on chain. But we're seeing this theme more and more across the ecosystem. I don't know if that brings up anything for you, but that's sort of what I'm seeing. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, yes. I want to plus one what you just said in that pixel. To me, pixel art was very intentional in that it's a very approachable medium. The people that are great at it are geniuses. 
So I don't want to downplay the skill kind of required to create it, but at the same time, it's at least more approachable. It's kind of like snowboarding. It's easier to get up on a board and stay up on a board. Now, to be great, you still have to be great, but mm-hmm. you don't. You aren't necessarily falling quite as much as, as skiing. And I kind of feel like it's approachable, especially like there's just constraints. I'm also going to say that like constraints in general are the artist's friend. So I think w- the the more open a canvas is, and be that like an actual canvas or like a music uh, canvas or a story like a blank writing page, like the more paralyzing that is. And the more discordant, the more discordant, I think like that the end artwork is. I think that's one of my favorite things with the artwork itself. As we have kind of evolved, people have found kind of like creating these like kind of center pieces for everyone else to help to hang their artwork on. So honestly, what I'd be really interested in is almost like a rotating primary, secondary art jam. So like if we were going to imagine a base paint for music, right? I don't know if it would make sense for a single, for everyone to like upload their tracks at once. I think it'd be more interesting to have one person upload a primary and then have four other people upload like a secondary track kind of like in support of that. And then just kind of like rotate it. So I'm at like, I'm almost imagining like four composers getting together and each one takes a turn leading that day. And then the, the other four kind of like, yeah, produce like sort of like that secondary mix to it. I, I read the Rick Rubin book on creativity recently, uh, which was great. I'm going to add to everyone else saying it's great. It's great. But he said something to the effect of Lear, like, there are moments where someone has to lead. That's to me is like one of the most paralyzing things of decentralization. Like you said, voting, right? Of course, all great artwork starts in the voting, even in the voting booth, booth, right? Like, I don't, I don't know if that's true. It, I do think that there is if you're going to think about acts of co-creation and like collaboration on chain, you do have to think about it in terms of like a natural lead follow, you know, primary, secondary, and that tension there, which I think we like, to me, this wasn't intentional. It was like half intentional, but to me, like the 5,000 pixels versus the 1,000 pixels that kind of created that natural primary, secondary, the people that we knew that were amazing pixel artists, we gave 5,000 pixels to on day one because we you're amazing. You're going to paint something amazing. And everyone else with the 100 pixels, like you can experiment, you can add to their work, you can work on your own stuff. But I think kind of allowing just enough chaos to let surprises emerge while also finding the people that you know are, I would say like bought in and have the level of skill to create the thing that needs to compete in the market, right? Like it's the old Reed Hastings quote, like we're not competing... Netflix isn't competing with HBO, it's competing with Fortnite and Sleep. Your on-chain activity is competing with everyone else's on-chain and off-chain activity. So it has to be like a certain level of good. It can't just be like pure chaos. But I think, yeah, like finding that dynamic of like lead versus follow, primary, secondary, and allowing people to contribute without necessarily placing all of the weight on their shoulders of making it great and finding the people who are capable of great work. That, that's like one of the dynamics I think about in that a lot. What about the revenue share model? I'm sure when you started this, you said yourself, you didn't, you didn't think it would go as long as it did or be as successful as it's been. So I'm sure you didn't anticipate that there would be over 190 ETH distributed to these artists. Do you think about it differently now that you see that there's more money being made? How are you approaching that? Love it. <laughs> yeah. To me... Art, so ETH distributed to artists is the thing I'm probably secondary to the artwork itself because the artwork itself is beautiful. But the thing I'm incredibly proud of is the fact that artists have made two ETH, five ETH. Like I'm, I'm not quite sure on the totals, but and I saw someone doing dashboard in terms of like total profitability for artists. But like, I'm going to be honest, it's really hard to be an artist. It's very difficult, especially with kind of like the emergence of AI, et cetera. Like you just kind of see this like, perpetual push down, like depression of wages, right? With artists. And it's been especially hard for NFT artists. One of the things that really excited me about NFTs is that it's the first deflationary technology to hit art in a millennia, right? Like it's the first thing that made art more rare versus more common. And so the idea that we were able to like basically like take the revenue, we didn't do like a treasury thing where people voted and then you got like, you know, you had kind of like ran into sort of like the politics of that. 
you just distributed it straight to the artist. That's like the second biggest highlight for me with face paint. It's so exciting to see. And I, I think one thing that is important to recognize is uh, it's not just pixel artists that are involved here. Yeah. And I have seen people talk about how they minted a brush and they filled in some background colors, yeah. right? Just to be part of it and just to participate. You know, it's not going to pay your paycheck or pay your mortgage or your rent, but you get a chance to get involved. And I think there is that, there is those levels of involvement from your expertise or your skill, which is really also, I think a another benefit of the co-creation is the way that it builds an opportunity to learn and to grow. We see that in the classroom. We see that in schools where you know you create together with your classmates and we all know that experience is the best teacher, but we don't see that a lot online because you can't really do any, I guess we see it in the form of memes, and but we have no idea who is involved. We have no idea who is participating. So there's a new sort of mechanic at play here as a result of on-chain. Yeah, so you inspired me. This is something I'm going to be saying from now on because I just thought of it based off of like kind of your your excellent monologue. But we saw a similar dynamic during the Renaissance, right? You had masters and then you had apprentices. And the apprentices would work in the master shop and they would pay down the artwork and then they would be paid out of the profits, the proceeds of that piece. And you kind of don't see that anymore. You have apprenticeships in other types of professions, like electricians and plumbers and everything. That's a great analogy. Thank you for sharing that because that's like really clicked. That unlocks something in my head in which this type of collaboration where you kind of like identify the primary and the secondary, this does almost create like an apprenticeship level, but it's like decentralized permissionless apprenticeship. Yeah. You come in, you can play with something really small. You can add to the piece. And then as you add to the piece, you build a reputation and you kind of like build the ability to uh, create more and then earn more and more of the revenue. That's awesome. Thank you. That's really super cool. cool. Super yeah. cool. I love it. You're welcome. I want to shift gears now, talk a little bit about your optimism application, the PGRF application. Mm -hmm. Maybe tell us about the application, but before you do, for those who don't know about Optimism PGRF, can you just tell us a little bit about what that is and give us a background? I can give you as much of a background as I'm familiar with. So if Optimism has a, uh, essentially has a retro fund. They fund projects that essentially had like an impact on their ecosystem. But if you go to their retro PGF fund, they actually have a formula where they talk about like how they measure impact. And they essentially, they have a really good chart where it says essentially like, Here's the impact and it's like one bar chart. And then they have another that is revenue, which is usually a lot smaller because it is crypto and, and it's just a race to erase margins basically. And then they have like the retro funding as essentially like the piece that is meant to make up the difference between the impact and then the revenue. And so we were recommended to apply. Shout out to Base, to Jesse and, and the folks at Base. I'm a huge fan of just, not just like how they supported us, but how they support interesting projects in the space. Mm -hmm. I think Jesse is one of those true believers who he has said multiple times, and this is something I believe in my bones, that we don't get to where we want to be. Like the, the future of crypto, like this decentralized future where like everything's on chain and everything. We don't get to there without designing experiences that are fun to have on chain for the entire cycle and not just like the five months where things are mooning. So he's reached out multiple times and said like, hey, like, you know, people building really cool things, please send them my way. And so, yeah, Jesse recommended that that we apply to the retro, uh, public goods retro funding, put together an application, put it in. And I believe voting is November 7th through December 7th. And essentially, from my understanding, you have badge holders who are essentially like people elected within optimism. They review all the applications, I believe like 600 and 20 something have, have applied and there is 30 million, I think it's 30 million OP to be distributed amongst these 600 projects based off of the impact. And then each badge holder submits a list with like kind of a recommendation. And then each badge holder then goes through the list, sees the recommendations and then votes on the allocation. And then I don't actually know how the allocation is finalized. I think it is like an average of everyone's allocation, or it might just be the rep, the lists are used as recommendations. I'm, I'm kind of unclear on mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Oh, well, I think is amazing about, you know, and 
just for, for, as a reminder for everybody, Base is built on the OP stack, which is why Base has incentive to also promote optimism. There's a great partnership there. Basically, Base shares profit with OP, the OP collective mm-hmm. for using the OP stack, right? And the OP stack is a way that Base spun up their la- their layer two and other there's others that are using the OP stack for their layer two as well. And so what's amazing is Optimism has, and all these chains have all these holders, right? Mm-hmm. And the thing that Optimism is really focused on is community engagement in their ecosystem, not just in terms of having more builders come and build on top of Optimism, but also in terms of, okay, let's turn our token holders into I almost want to go as far as saying co-creators, so that might be a bit far. Let's turn our token holders into voters and reward them for voting. And so the every Optimism airdrop, you actually get more tokens in the airdrop if you participate in voting within the Optimism ecosystem. So oh. yeah, so here we have the retroactive, which is the this retro public good fund. So basically it's like, as you said, Zach, it's like any per, any project that's on top of Optimism or Base, because Base is on top of Optimism, that you can apply. There's over 600 that have applied, and you can get funding for your project because you have already done something mm-hmm. great. And so it, you guys are on there right now, and I hope that anybody listening that is a badge holder at Optimism, go vote for Base Paint so that the these guys can get some additional funding coming their way. I know that there's 30 million OP that gets distributed through this round, this round of funding, which as you said, is November 7th to December 7th. So yeah, really exciting to see that, exciting to see you guys growing there. Because I think the main thing that I get so excited with base paint and curious to get your thoughts on this before we wrap here is we really need more fun, non-speculative crypto on-chain apps. We just don't have enough of them and they you know we can get into why that is but curious how you see sort of the ecosystem right now and what you think when you think down the road do you think we're heading in the direction of you know this the next wave of adoption will be as a result of on-chain apps do you think we're going that direction or do you think we're heading in a different direction i think there's two different channels of adoption and i think on one hand crypto is macro It's hard to trust or are kind of like believe that the next bull market, I'm I'm sorry to be negative, Nancy. It's hard to believe the next bull market is going to come from consumer adoption, like from like, I would say non-speculative consumer adoption, when on the other hand, everybody's waiting for the ETF approval rates to be slashed. Like these are all speculative events, right? (laughs) These are but this is good. So now I will say though that in terms of a long, like a long tail, right? Like five years, 10 years, I do think that like actual sustainable growth is going to be from consumer experiences that prioritize the consumer and can prioritize like people having fun where Web3 is the enabling technology. So like Nike swoosh, right? Like to me, those type of projects are incredibly bullish not necessarily for the next bull run, but for the life of crypto in general. And that's kind of where I want to continue to experiment, not because I think that these are going to be the projects that moon in the next 18 months, 24 months, whenever the next bull market is. But I do think that that is like kind of existentially what crypto needs in order to be relevant to normal people. What I'm personally scared of, and I have been building in crypto since 2018. I've worked on like stuff like public good stuff. I worked on um, research for like CBDCs. I've like done a whole bunch of stuff. The thing I'm scared of is spending all this time in my career working on these things, really just to like build the next set of financial rails that JP Morgan runs on. <laughs> like that's what I'm scared of. And I think that that's what keeps me up at night. And I think the way that we manifest a reality that isn't that, where crypto and decentralized technology is like something that people use and are delighted by is by focusing on these consumer experiences. And so that's why I'm incredibly bullish of it on the next five years and 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think you bring up a really great point there. And I think that's what the normies or the non-Web3 people are missing right now. And it's tough to blame them. Try to explain to somebody e-commerce before 
we had e-commerce, right? They'd be like, what do you mean? I'm going to trust, I'm going to buy something online and use my credit card. I don't trust that person. How do I get it? Shipping? We don't ship things yet. Like that's not what we do. We don't have, so it's the same idea. And most of the world sees blockchain as crypto exclusively yeah. and they see it as this monetary revolution. I think that's what you know, Web3 Academy, we're trying to teach that it's not just a monetary re revolution. It's a revolution of the entire internet and mm -hmm. all of our digital assets and our identity and our voting and all these other things that go so far beyond that. But at the same time, speculation is what brings people in. So yeah. we have like, this- just hello world of crypto. Yeah. It's a big quote. And it is something like you have to acknowledge that that is kind of the reality that we're building in. But I do think it is possible it is possible to build something where speculation isn't like the core use case. And I would love to see more people build that. If you're doing it, DM me and I'll help however I can because I still want to see more of those experiences out in the world. I love it. I love it. For those who want to get involved in base paint, how do they get involved? Where do they go? How can they, How can, I mean, where can they DM you actually? You said they could DM you. What's your, oh, yeah. what's your Twitter? And Z Hearing is my Twitter. So yeah, DM me and I'm happy to, I've been building products for, probably 14 years now in crypto since 2018. I've helped a lot of teams. I love helping teams. I love building new things with new people. So please reach out if you've got questions or ways that I can be helpful. To get involved with BasePaint, I would say show up show up on BasePaint.xyz. That's the app. You can participate in the chat. You can mint a brush. You can mint canvases. Just join in. Have, a fun, have fun with us. And if you like the vibes, you want to get a deeper end and and we are always looking for new contributors on a deeper level technical etc as well cool awesome we'll throw some links in the show notes as well for everybody so they can uh, find those easily if you don't remember a couple quick questions before we wrap here a little bit of a speed round what's an nft you'll never sell oh man i think nfts i'll never sell so the first pfp kind of like generative project i found that I got really excited about, I probably won't sell. In fact, I'd love to pick up some more. Solos.so, I think it was Denison Bertram and then Bertali and then a painter friend of his. They did these really cool abstract portraits, which was my PFP for a while. And they're just really cool. Like I, I'm never going to sell that, probably never sell uh, my base schools because the vibes and I don't know, there's a couple of others. I'm not a good NFT trader. So if I buy it, it's kind of the kiss of death that it's never going up. But I have a lot of art that I love that I'm never getting rid of. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I have, I have similar experience with NFTs. <laughs> One thing you've bought recently for under $100 that brings you joy doesn't have to be a digital good. Doesn't have to be a digital good? That's a good question. Because I've picked up a couple of Switch games that have been pretty darn good. Half-Life, the remake of Half-Life is was free actually on his 25th birthday. Yeah, I really like video games. I like gaming. So I think experimenting with like small indie games has probably been that. Oh, Vampire Survivor. It was like five bucks on Steam. It's the simplest game imaginable. There's an amazing Del Clip documentary about it. It was really just a guy building it in his spare time. He used all of these like kind of found parts to like kind of cobble together this like idea that he had. It caught fire. People went crazy for it. Now he has like a company around this thing that he threw together on the weekend. I played that over the week uh, a couple of days ago and I got obsessed with it. It shows how incredible simplicity and like just simple, simple, simple mechanisms are that people can just kind of like hook onto and just, it's just sort of like feeds this play loop. So yeah, Vampire Survivor for like five bucks or 20 bucks has been like, has been really not just fun, but really instructive in terms of like how I'm thinking about base paint and other digital products. Yeah, I was going to say, ironically, I feel like you just described base paint when you said he started something on the weekend and <laughs> then it became a full company and a team. <laughs> yeah, I found I found it pretty pretty inspiring. I'm not going to lie. That no clip documentary was pretty pretty good to, cool. pretty good to read. Cool. Okay, last question. If you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? Oh, I've already... So I've, this already happened. I don't know if it's a billion people, but to Taylor... Uh, in base paint, he rented the Times Square billboard for okay. 20 seconds, and we played a time lapse of a base paint of one of the base paint canvases. So there's like a, I'll send you the link so you can include it in the show notes. But there's literally a video of a base paint canvas time lapse as it's being drawn over 24 hours in Times Square, with everybody looking at this, going like, "What is S X copy, and why do these people care about it?" That was awesome. So I would probably just repeat that 
I probably cool. will just let Taylor repeat that because that was pretty awesome. And t- is this Taylor who's also the founder of Perk Shop as well? Yeah. 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 He's, he's like, he's a great, he's, well, he's, yeah. he's paying OG. He's awesome. Cool. Cool. So I'm just curious, how much does it cost for 20 seconds on in Times Square? Do you know? No idea. I think it's actually somewhat cheap. I think actually that might be the hundred dollar. If I had done it, I would have said that would have been the best hundred dollars I've spent recently because I think it is like in that price range. Interesting. I'll, I just posted that thing in, in the chat. That was awesome. And so I would just do a billboard with that. There you go. I love it. Zach, thanks so much for the time. Appreciate everything you guys are building. Excited to continue to watch the progress of base paint. Amazing. Thanks so much. This has been an awesome conversation. I really appreciate it. So much fun to jam. And uh, yeah, man, hope if folks got something out of this, if they have questions, if they want to build something cool and I can be helpful, please hit me up. Love it. Thanks for listening and everybody have a great day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.